So I was assigned a skill maintenance for generalist anesthesiologists. And how many here think that we need to maintain our skills? We need further education. Raise your hand. How many people here think that once you graduate a program that uh, you're maximized out as far as skill maintenance? OK. All right, only a couple hands. So that's probably correct. So we'll move on. So this is our objectives. We're going to describe and discuss the attributes of, that characterizes expert skill. We're going to describe and discuss what deliberate practice is and why we should be doing it. And we're also going to determine if simulation is actually beneficial. Can high-level expertise be nurtured? And even since the Greek philosophers, it, is it, a, are you born with it, or is it a learned behavior? So that, like I said, so elite performance, is it inborn or learned? And psychologist Benjamin Bloom, what he looked at is 120 star performers in the art, sports, and scientific fields. And he concluded that it is a hard work and training and not accept a native ability alone is not the reason. So you really have to work at it. So you do need some inborn characters. You need to have a tendency towards stuff, but you really have to work at it if you want to be good. So expertise is definitely a learned behavior. Now, why is it necessary? And I, I thought this was, was pretty good. There's a number of reasons. So it's you want to be able to deliver good anesthetic care. You want to be able to solve difficult situations that you're in. You want to be able to run more efficient, efficiently. And you also have a better quality of life. And we talk about the, the incidence of burnout and depression has really increased. And that you basically have higher self-esteem and you have a longer term career satisfaction. So the more expert that you become, the better off in the quality of life that you have. Now, how does one obtain expertise? So it's manifested through the use of superior skills, and it includes perceptual, motor, and cognitive skills. And you can get that attainment, you get that level, if you practice about four hours per day for 10 to 15 years. So even though you graduate a program, you still have to do that additional, it's like that 10,000 hour rule. So in contrast, if you just learn a particular skill and you really only need about 50 hours or so that you can just re reach that level. So you can be competent or come in, but you will reach a plateau and you're able to do it. So top performers, they use deliberate practice. So once a specific, so what is the expertise process? So you work towards a specific goal and you still, you work more towards it. So you go towards a more difficult task so you can get to a higher level. Deliberate practice is a critical factor and it's used in a lot of skill domains. So it involves rehearsal, you get a mentor. So we know a lot of these uh, really good coaches, really, really good athletic performers like in the Olympics, they have coaches or they have tutors and it's an orchestrated effort. So similar steps, they're, they're found not only in medicine but also in organized sports, music and the performing arts. So what is deliberate practice? So it's repeated training. So you reach higher levels until you can get to a really expert level. So it's, it's um, designated to improve performance. It's repeated a number of times. You have feedback uh, on how well you're doing. It's, it's mentally highly demanding. And a lot of times it's not fun, because if it was fun, you, not everyone could be an expert. So you're given the task, you're challenged. So you continually have to be challenged to get to a higher level. You have to be motivated. You actually want to be better. You want to be the best. You, want, you also need feedback, and you're prompted to reflect. Well, how well, how can I do better next time? How did I do? So attaining the expert performance, it's uh, adequate expertise. So like I said, so like maybe doing a, an epidural or a CSE technique, you only need like 50 hours or less. So you can maintain it and you can do it, but that necessarily doesn't make you an expert. It gets to the point where it becomes automatic and you continue to improve. So like I said, 10 to 15 years of clinical practice till you get really good. So it's, that's called deliberate practice and you improve over 10 to 15 years. And that's how you get the expert level. Now this is the Dreyfus model and it, it just basically just shows that 
that um, you start as a novice, competence, proficiency, expertise, and then you have mastery. So that's where you want to go. If you're just doing a typical labor epidural or a certain putting in central IV, central line and A line, you can get competent and proficient, but that doesn't mean that you have actual mastery in the whole scheme of things. So attaining that is that you want to actively seek improvement, and if you cease, then you'll just you'll plateau out. You'll just stay at one certain level. And if you look here at just practice, you'll just plateau out and you'll stay here, whereas deliberate practice, and I'll come over here, is that it's almost like a stepping stone effect. So you just keep these definite steps, and you get a higher level of attainment. And this basically on here just shows that if you do, you become, you plateau out, if you arrest your development, you just stay on one plateau, whereas expert performance, you continue to grow. So how much time? I pretty much said it. You need about 10,000 hours or 10 to 15 years of deliberate practice until you become an expert. So does, it does the residency, does the training program give you expertise? Does it give you mastery? No. If you do a four-year program, you only get about 3,000 hours or three years of actual anesthesia, and that only gives you 3,240 hours. So that definitely doesn't get, you have to go above and beyond. So you do, you, you stay in that field and you continue to practice. So anywhere, someone in their mid-30s and 40s, and actually when I was looking at this, you're saying, oh, mid-30s, people like get into their anesthesia residency in their mid-30s. So we're talking maybe mid-40s, maybe even as old as me, but maybe not, okay. So what are entrustable professional activities? So this is just something that as I was doing my research, you get to look at it and it, what is it? What is an EPA? It's actually coming out in, the, in graduate medical education. In our medical students, they, are, they want to know that, that they're we, graduating medical students that don't even know how to do histories and physicals. And because we don't let them do the electronic medical record, they're not doing adequate. So what the medical schools are entrusted to do is come up with EPAs, entrustable professional activities. They need to come up with 13. It's not defined yet, but it's, they want to make sure that if you graduate a medical student and he goes into to graduate medical education, can this person perform an adequate history? Uh, history? It's moving into all, all the uh, graduate medical education programs, like surgery, GI, it, anesthesia. It's almost like milestones that they have, and it's just for certain procedures. And this is just an example for gastroenterology that they can manage liver diseases, that they can do a, a colonoscopy, th that type of thing. So those are EPAs, and that's what's coming down the, the pipe. So do anesthesiologists continue to approve after residency? So this was a study by Henricks, and what he did, it was really good, is he looked at 35 practicing anesthesiologists that were in, that graduated from two to 26 years in practice, and he gave the, those anesthesiologists eight scripted simulation critical intraoperative events that they should be able to normally do. And they just arbitrarily said 75%, if you, you graded 75% or, or better, that you actually passed it and you, you gave appropriate management. Some individuals had mediocre scores, and in fact, a lot of them, or in some of them, were ineffective, and they were surprised as to how low did they, below 75% that they actually got. So in spite of finishing residency and even graduating and being a licensed anesthesiologist, there was a subset who did not even achieve adequate skills. That's almost scary, you know, that, the, the, all, that you do not have that. So for some anesthesiologists, their skills deteriorated, and, but for others, they, they speculated that some of the anesthesiologists never even mastered those skills. So that's why it's really important to have deliberate practice. So these are just studies. So there's multiple studies out there that look at this deliberate practice and skill maintenance. And this just shows multiple studies that have been done that have shown this.
So it's simulation. So that's one thing. So how do you master? So how about simulation? And it, actually, if you think about it, if we're using simulation in medical education, we're using it for graduate medical ed education too, that probably does have some use, and it does. So they've been used since the 1990s. It gives you multiple opportunities. It, you, you can train. It gives you a controlled environment unlimited chances to practice where you don't cause harm to the patient and you avoid risk. And residents who trained with simulators responded more quickly, they performed better, and they de deviated less. So it, it can help and it, in certain procedures where you may not see enough of them. So maybe like an amniotic fluid embolism, you may not see it in your whole career, that at least you can train and then if it should happen, you can jump on it and provide appropriate treatment. So motor skills can be assessed and you can even do partial tasks uh, trainers. So like labor epidurals or ultrasound techniques. So those are partial task trainers. So advantages of simulation, you can work on technical skills, non-technical skills. You can do team training, so multidisciplinary if there's a code in the OR. Uh, acquiring technical skills, and it fits well with the three-stage model of cognition, integration, and automation. And it can also be focused based on the level of the trainee. So if you're just um, simple labor epidural, how to do it in maybe a first year, you can do that where there's altered advanced techniques, maybe doing a CSC or uh, EVE or epidural volume expense. Uh, extension. So there's different types and you can titrate to the level of the training. So the advantages, it, it gives you a procedural process. You can do repetitive processes, so you can do it multiple times. It provides a safe environment. You won't cause any harm. It gives you objective evidence, so you can actually be graded. And I'll show you about an OSCE, that's on a future slide. And you can do certain procedures where you normally wouldn't want to do, uh, or you couldn't do, like a cricho emergency cricothyroidomy. So this is the objective structured clinical examination, and this is used a lot, not only in medical school, but also for anesthesia residents, and to have they managed a certain level. So this could be for like a physical exam. So it's now widely used, and in fact, that's like, that's part of step two. So they take it in medical school, you have to pass step one, which is just the basics. Step two is more clinical, and then you have to pass the physical part of it or this, this uh, objective structured clinical examination. And, there have, and you, they can basically get um, graded on history taking, physical examination, communication skills, interpretation of laboratory results, and also the ability to perform technical procedures. And this is what uh, they do. But for skill maintenance, it can be outcome-based, it's competency-based, you can have individualized learning, they can assess your skills and competency, and it can be processed through the following steps. So they can demonstrate, so show me that you can do an adequate H&P. Analysis, explain the steps, how is it done? And then understanding, the trainee can actually perform and do a, a physical exam, and also you can objectively quantify their performance. So also simulation limitations, though, what's, what's really are, it, it costs a lot of money to have to build that room, to have the monitors, to have the dummy there. So there's a, a need for a dedicated simulation room, and also audiovisual system, and you need to have some workers that need to maintain it. You need separate debriefing rooms. You need programs, uh, certain programs, to depending on the situation, and also trained faculty and staff that's able to run it. This is just a, an article from Chang that, that this is a structure of they called anesthesia non-technical skills. And if you look at it, there's the things that you can objectively look, grade, criticize, and measure. So ta oh, I'm sorry, uh, task management. You can look at teamwork, you can look at situation awareness, and also decision making. So a lot of these things can be graded and be objective, and you can get proper feedback uh, for growth. There's other types too, so it doesn't have to be particularly simulation. So you can do test-based learning where you incorporate that into deliberate practice. 
by testing. You can also um, do the flip classroom, and that's, that was big recently within the past five to 10 years. And what you do is you give the information to the person beforehand, the trainee, so you read about it, and then the next day when they come in for that particular lecture or that workshop, you tell me about it. What did you read about? So that's the flip classroom. So they actually teach the, the instructor. You can also do distributed practice. And what that is, and, and sort of most people learn by like 20 minutes uh, snippets where you just learn a little bit. Like to go like an hour, two hours, it's really hard to learn. So if you do divide it, you split that learning material into like 20 minute time periods or 30 minutes, then it shows that you can actually grow and, and build and do the step up routine. And you have better long term retention uh, of the information. Another way is task interleaving. And what that is, so you have four tasks, A, B, C, and D. So rather just do A, B, C, and D, you can sort of repetitive. You can do A three times. You can do B three times. You can do D three times. So you sort of inter, 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 interwove it and change it around. And that gives you, you can build on learning those particular tasks. You can also do guided discovery learning, so the, the learning is provided with a limited instruction and they have to discover, find out, tell me about it. Why don't you go ahead and do the research on it and get back to me and tell me what you've learned. And then also people can learn effectively by building on their own, own law, knowledge. Okay. so. How do you uh, improvement through feedback? It's really important that you have feedback. So just to be, able to be on your own, you can do it, but it's really hard. It's really good to have a coach or a mentor or someone to give you feedback so you can get better. So it, it can be a challenge. So to have that, you need to be able to acquire the ability to monitor the critique and refine on your own in, in your own performance. Well, I could have did better. And a nice analogy is the budding piano virtuoso who basically knows that it should sound like this. This is how it needs to be. And you sort of know just by understanding and listening to it. And that's the same type of analogy. I can get better because this is where I need to go and I could hit this note a little better and you know do this chord uh, just so it sounds better. So direction and feedback is very important and it's really important to have a mentor or the tutelage of coaches and you can see that in the in the um, expert sports world. So other continuing medical education venues, you can do CME activities, but what they, the literature says is you need to choose wisely. Just because it's a CME activity, it might be not of benefit. So we all know that coming to the Sol Snyder meeting is, provides ample benefit and is really good to come to. And also the SOAP meeting um, in, in um, Florida would also be good to come to, too. So active learning, opportunities to practice, get the feedback, and in fact, there's even a society out there, the best evidence medical education, and that's for teachers in medical education, and they even have a website that you can go to to help you to become a, a better mentor. So here's the, the cone of learning, and we've all heard this, and so we all know that it, after two weeks, we tend to remember 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see in here, 70% of what we say, and 90% of what we say and do. And that's sort of like deliberate practice. We have to be able to say, do it, and continue to do it. And even Confucius says, I see and I forget. I hear and I remember. I do and I understand. And then as far as uh, conclusions, expertise, it's not inbred. So you may be born with some certain characteristics that might put you a little bit of an advantage, it's a learned behavior. You have to work at it. And you have to do it through deliberate practice. You need about 10,000 hours to become a, an expert, so that's about 10 to 15 years of advanced practice. And you also need direction and feedback uh, to, to attain that level of expertise. And that's it. Thank you. And we'll get our next speaker.